Thank you very much. Um, I haven't got slides that I'm going to be putting up. Um, and I'm aware that we've, we've pushed on quite a bit in terms of the available time. So I just want to make some remarks and um, introduce a particular perspective, which I might think uh, would think really useful for the conversation. So um, I head up a program with the South African Institute of International Affairs. We are a policy think tank, but the program that I work in looks particularly at natural resource governance issues, uh, including climate change. Um, so it is research, it is policy. We are not implementing EBA per se, but over the last few years, we've done a fair amount of research both in South Africa and in the broader region around how EBA is conceptualized and implemented and lessons that can be learned around uh, more effective interventions in the EBA uh, space. Um, now, the perspective that I want to bring in is um, something that hasn't come up um, much in the conversation so far, and that is uh, EBA and its relevance to coastal and marine governance. Um, now, I think that perhaps this, this picture has been changing somewhat, but certainly uh, a few years back, we did find that climate change uh, policies uh, often did not adequately reflect um, climate impacts and potential responses on the marine and coastal environment. And similarly, you had the emergence of many coastal zone governance, integrated coastal zone governance, ocean governance policies, even fisheries policies that did not, again, adequately uh, reflect um, climate change impacts. Um, that picture has been changing, um, but um, certainly in, I think it's fair to say in the early days, even in South Africa, which is, uh, as we've heard, has moved quite far in, in the policy space on EBA, um, in the early days, there was certainly uh, far less emphasis on uh, potential interventions in, in the coastal and marine space. Um, and that really is a reflection of how this debate has emerged uh, generally. Uh, we saw as the concept of EBA emerged, a lot of interest in its application in terms of um, watershed management, wetland restoration, um, generally terrestrial ecosystems. Um, and there was really a moment um, around with the with the 2004 East Asian tsunami, um, where it was very apparent that those coastal uh, villages, towns that did have healthy uh, vegetated coastal ecosystems, mangrove ecosystems, were better protected from from storm surge from the tsunami um, than those where these ecosystems had been degraded. And it was really from that moment that there was a far stronger interest in how the concept of EBA um, is applicable to a marine uh, ecosystem preservation, conservation, and, and, and rehabilitation. Um, now, I'm not going to go into a whole uh, talk around the impacts of climate change on the oceans. Uh, it's safe to say that they are. Um, diverse and uh, have quite uh, severe impacts. Um, ocean warming, ocean acidification, most of us have heard around uh, sea level rise. Um, these kind of primary changes then have secondary influences. For example, ocean acidification can impact on um, uh, the life cycle of, of, of crustacea, of fish, it's been shown to influence um, uh, fish breeding and in the early stages of development and so forth. Ocean warming changes to ocean currents then influences where uh, the natural distribution of fish, which obviously then has an impact on, on fishing communities. And, uh, and the one that we, we see in the media often is this reference to more intense and more frequent uh, tropical storm systems. Um, it also is worth pointing out, um, though I think most of us would be very aware of this, that um, our coastal and marine ecosystems are, face a range of, a range of pressures um, from overfishing or poorly governed fisheries. I'm speaking now 
broadly, and I'll zero in on, on, on South Africa in certain cases, but broadly overfishing, poorly governed fisheries, habitat degradation, pollution. We've, I think many people in, in the broader or who have an interest in, in environmental space um, have, have, have seen this big push around awareness of um, marine plastics or you know, plastic pollution finding its way into the oceans. Um, poorly managed coastal urban development is having a, a big impact on, on our coastal ecosystems. Of course, all of this plays out in a, in a time when there is, uh, uh, has been a, a huge increase in attention on the oceans, um, recognizing on the one hand these impacts and the risks that oceans face. On the other hand, also and often framed around the idea of a blue economy or an ocean economy in South Africa, the discussion around Operation Pakisa, recognizing that there is significant um, uh, potential, uh, economic potential, potential for uh, socioeconomic opportunities, um, and a debate about how these opportunities can be exploited, um, but sustainably exploited. Um, similarly, SDG 14 on the ocean, I won't go into, into too much length. Um, I don't have a presentation, but I will share some links um, uh, and that'll give you far more detail around these issues. Uh, the IPCC brought out uh, a report, I think it was last year, year on oceans in the cryosphere where they lay out in great detail um, uh, the impacts uh, of climate change on the ocean, uh, there's a high level panel for the sustainable ocean economy they haven't brought out their main report yet but they've released a number of interim reports which addresses um, all these key issues around uh, habitat degradation ocean plastics and so forth um, now one thing that I, I do want to point out, especially because we are talking about the South African environment, is that when we say EBA in the coastal environment, for many years, the th thinking went immediately to um, mangrove restoration, mangrove protection systems. That was uh, a, a large part of the focus when it came to marine EBA programs for a number of years. But uh, obviously, South Africa doesn't have extensive mangrove ecosystems, and I think it's very important to stress that um, uh, marine ecosystem, marine EBA and coastal EBA is much more um, than, than just uh, mangrove ecosystems. Um, our institute did some research looking not only at South African um, EBA projects in the coastal marine environment, but also looking at Seychelles, Mozambique, Tanzania, and generally getting a sense of uh, the uh, operations in this environment more broadly. Um, in South Africa, uh, there's been, uh, well, we heard some reference to the work in, in Durban already. Um, obviously, we're talking about different ecosystems here. So uh, it might be estuarine systems, um, coastal dunes, coastal wetlands, vegetated coastal ecosystems generally. Um, uh, in the tropical, in tropical zones outside of South Africa also, EBA projects might focus on something like boundary, boundary reef systems and the impact that has. But here in South Africa, um, I think there's a lot of potential, already work underway, but a lot of further potential for work on, on estuaries, coastal dune systems and so forth. Um, I'm glad that uh, taking us right back to the beginning with Barney's presentation, he was very clear about, you know, where where EBA sits and the, the guidelines that he gave us in the introduction to uh, actually provide a, a fantastic Venn diagram that, that just kind of gives you that picture of what exactly is EBA. Climate angle has to have the, the social angle, socio-economic angle, and all of that happens within a framework of uh, a kind of sustainable development uh, lens. Those are your, your basic criteria and something that one needs to keep returning to, um, to think about, uh, you know, designing and effectively implementing uh, EBA systems. Um, 
I'm not going to go into a great amount of detail in particular projects. Um, again, I can provide links to papers that our institute has developed, which um, provides a write-up of some of these projects. Safe to say that there's some uh, excellent work being done on coastal dune rehabilitation, which has obvious um, socio-economic uh, benefits um, in terms of urban development. Um, but also important um, biodiversity and adaptation um, uh, benefits on, on storm surges and so forth. The work being done in Isimondelisu uh, uh, around the uh, St. Lucia estuary um, uh, to restore natural functioning of that ecosystem. Um, there's a few lessons really that I want to point out in, in my brief remarks. Um, around moving forward on this and I think even on some of the project reviews that we've seen in the earlier presentations you do get a sense of this um, and that is certainly that in designing these projects you've got to recognize that you know you're dealing with with multiple players and in complex systems um, even just if we're thinking about partnerships within within a government agency um, um, obviously uh, Barney and his team in biodiversity and conservation, um, EBA sits under that directorate uh, within DEF. But there are elements of this work which is also relevant for the climate change directorate and in the coastal zone, obviously uh, elements of the work where you want to be working closely with oceans and coasts. So coordination communication is, is, is absolutely key. Similarly, when we spoke to teams and individuals working uh, in, in Etapeni and in Cape Town on uh, EBA uh, systems, um, you know, a common challenge is that, uh, you know, you're working across, across departments. Um, not everyone might be totally bought into the idea of a nature-based solution or approach. Um, there's a lot of kind of internal lobbying that needs to be done, a lot of potential for, for, for uh, miscommunication, I guess, that, that then impedes, impedes progress. Um, linked to that, but looking broadly than just your stakeholders themselves, um, there's a lot of work, and again, I'm sure our presenters will attest to this, a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of um, buy-in, um, buy-in from um, from, from communities affected by a project, um, uh, obviously buying from, from funders, implementing agencies, governance agencies. Um, and I think particularly in our South African environment, not new to our, our presenters, but maybe some in the audience, is the sensitivities around projects that are, that are, that have a, a conservation and ecosystem um, lens uh, really uh, the emphasis on the, uh, the, the social benefit um, and the social justice aspects of these projects um, is is absolutely essential to to, to gain traction with with uh, stakeholders not only in the communities as I said but broader government stakeholders um, and then again this is the problem with being <laughs> being uh, the last uh, speaker uh, down the long list is um, uh, you, you have to repeat a few things, but measuring impact. Um, and it was uh, wonderful to see what Woolworths is, is doing in terms of the kind of independent evaluation, very data intensive. Um, and, and you see that in all the presentations, uh, really. Um, but, but thinking about measuring impact, being clear about the objectives. I think one of the challenges that we see as there's a little bit of a, a kind of an EBA wave in the, in the broader kind of um, climate finance or uh, development financing space, um, the risk is that the, this idea that you, you, you can um, at the same time achieve biodiversity, climate and social objectives. It's one thing to lay that out in a, in a project proposal, but you know, less, uh, you know, our experience has shown you have to be absolutely clear about exactly what are the impact pathways, uh, what are your objectives, your criteria, what are you measuring within each of those um, 
those main areas. Um, so, so the data and the communication aspect of these things are, are, are absolutely important. I think it is worth noting that, I mean, uh, again, thinking about the, why we're all here, um, the GCF does already fund coastal work, um, fund coastal EBA work um, within Africa and elsewhere in the world. So there's certainly potential for um, developing this sort of work. And then something that's worth mentioning as well, especially in some of our research, which has looked at, at the urban environment and EBA in a coastal urban environment, is that they should be an openness to hybrid systems. There are times when you may look at combining uh, nature-based and engineered solutions. Um, and, and sometimes that, that may be the best way to go. So there's, there should be space, at least for a conversation about, about hybrid solutions.